förstår all text så finns det mycket man kan lyssna på i andra språk. Det finns rytmer, det finns musik i språken. Det är, när vi gjorde den här programserien för två år tillbaka då hade jag varit ute på ett ställe här utanför Göteborg ett ställe som heter Körn. Känner ni, känner ni till det? Ja, det, det heter Körn på samma som kyssa här får du veta. Körn. Var det rätt? Ja. Då kan jag också kyssa. Men när jag kom tillbaka jag tyckte det var mycket mycket fint och så eh, sa vår kapellmästare Kurt Erik så sa han men det är fint där ute du. <laughs> det är fint där ute du. <laughs> För mig lät det som en trompetfanfar. Det är fint där ute du. <laughs> Sen eh, har jag också eh, kommunicerat lite med en, en norsk och, eh, och en dag så skulle jag steka en kyckling och, och så sa jag Karoli Vidlöj. Som på danska betyder, tycker du om vitlök? Men hon tyckte det lät precis som en, som en tromfigur. Liksom, kallavula, baff, 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 kallavula, baff, 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 kallavula, 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 baff, baff, Sen skulle hon fråga om jag hade vänt på kycklingen så sa hon, snudde du den? Ha? Snudde du den? tänkte jag på att, att en bil på dansk, på, på dansk slang, det heter en dytt, liksom dytt, 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 dytt. Så om man skulle kommunicera dansk norsk, om man skulle fråga om man är vän på bilen så skulle det vara snudde dytten, dytten. Så jag har försökt att göra lite musik ut av det här. My guest tonight is one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. He reminds me of an old, wise Chinese philosopher. And inside this philosopher, there's a curious four-year-old child imitating everything he sees and everything he hears. And inside the little child is a big man with an even bigger heart. This man I've chased for two and a half years to make him be in the show. But he's always been too busy writing, directing, acting, doing charity work for the UNICEF, all sorts of, all sorts of things. But five minutes, literally five minutes before we had the press conference for this show, I made a last desperate attempt and called. The phone was answered, yes. I said, um, I would like to speak to Mr. Ustinov. Speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I am Eddie Scholar. Oh yes, I guess I've got quite a few letters from you lately. <laughs> but look, um, right now, there, in three minutes, there's a press conference where we're gonna inform the press who's gonna be in the show. Do you want to participate? Of course. <laughs> Go tell them. That would be a perfect timing, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Peter Ustinov.
So, here you are. Here I am, and ready to speak Swedish. <laughs> when were you last in Sweden? That's... Uh, in Sweden? The last time I was in Gothenburg, and the only time I was in Gothenburg, was 1946. <laughs> yes. Has it, has it changed? I, it, uh, uh, I didn't see it well enough then to recognize it again now. <laughs> <laughs> but I came in just after the war, when I came out of the army, and in a car made in 1937, I arrived in Stavanger and drove here through Grimstad, Arendal, Porsgrun, Oslo, Moss, Udevala, and Kungalv. <laughs> and what made you come? I was invited here by, by Lars Schmidt, uh, the, f the parents of Lars Schmidt, who lived at Lerum. And uh, I'd never been to Sweden before. It was Christmas, after the war, where we didn't have a very agreeable time, as you can have guessed by now. And uh, it was a very full Christmas. I wasn't used to Swedish hospitality at all. And Lars Schmidt's father was a colonel, an Överst of the Jämtlands Feldjäger Regiment. <laughs> And there was a dinner of 50 people. They were absolutely wonderful hospitality. But I had to take a lady into dinner who didn't understand English very well, unlike the audience, and it shows how things have developed. <laughs> and I heard my own voice saying to her, yes, in England we have buses on two levels because there are people who like to... And then I realized she wasn't listening to me. She was going, score <laughs> I thought, my God, and then 49 people I had to go, and I didn't know Swedish manners yet, and I, and I drank every time, <laughs> quite a lot. So by the time I had scolded about 30 people, I was beginning to get to the stage of inebriation where <laughs> my eye became extremely sharp. You know, there is that moment before you... And I suddenly noticed that one of the gentlemen at the table had this button opened, or, or lost. I, it was turned back. And I remember thinking... <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked at his other sleeve. Same thing. And I thought to myself, my God, it's very rare that one meets a gentleman who's lost two buttons. Uh, so I thought that's very really hard. <laughs> And I looked at another one, and he also had that button open. And I began to find that everybody had. And I had my art, the suit I was given when I left the army, which they threw at me, judging my size. It was a terrible, terrible brown suit with... Uh, you could hardly move, it was so stiff, the cardboard inside the army. All sorts of... And I felt, and mine weren't practical. I thought, my God, what a disgrace. This is a country where everybody has this button open and I can't open mine. And I tried to eat like suddenly old Colonel Schmidt looked at me and said, School, welcome to Sverige. I said, ask. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Colonel? Yes, of course. I said, I can't help noticing that everybody has this button. <laughs> Should I have mine open? He said, no, no, you're not Swedish. <laughs> I said, what is the secret? He said, we in Sweden, in the regiment, will always have this button open till Finland comes back to us again. <laughs> that was a sobering thought. I was drunk enough to say, you mustn't lose any more territory. It comes... <laughs> Um, you have, you have once, uh, I think you have said, I, I, I believe you could have said that uh, humor is just another way of being serious. No, I didn't, I, I didn't make any rash claims like that. It's, it's the only way I know of being serious. I confined it to my own experience. I'm not suggesting it's your case at all. <laughs> you don't have to say it that way. <laughs> I wouldn't be so rude. 
anyway, um, you have in the, in the work you do, uh, I guess that that you uh, humor is always somewhere existing. Well, you always see it everywhere. For instance, um, we were invite my wife and I were invited to the White House. And I didn't expect to find very much humor there. It was at the occasion of the state visit of the Prince of Wales and uh, his wife. And uh, I was sitting at, with all big banquet at small tables of eight. And the host at my table was Nancy Reagan. <laughs> Very charming. And my immediate neighbor was a famous ballerina who seemed a little bit abstract. You know the way ballerinas can be at times. <laughs> As though she had a greater predilection for flowers than for people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, suddenly we heard behind us the uh, teaspoon against a glass. And there was uh, uh, standing. Can I stand up? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to raise my glass in this White House of ours to welcome the wonderful Prince of Wales and his lovely Lady David. So the, the ballerina suddenly, uh, she, she suddenly was transformed and she treated me like a stolen bicycle. <laughs> and she said, what did he say? I said, nothing. He's thinking of next weekend at Camp Diana. <laughs> Well, that's where humor comes in with it, where you don't expect it at all. I, I thought it was a state dinner. The same thing happened to me in London with Mrs. Thatcher, when suddenly we were invited to lunch with Mrs. Thatcher. I'd never been invited before to 10 Downing Street. I'd known, I know Ted Heath very well. I know quite a few of the old prime ministers. They've never invited me. And suddenly this invitation to 10 Downing Street from Mrs. Thatcher, I couldn't understand what happened. And then I realized it coincided with the state visit of Mrs. Finnbogger Dottir, <laughs> the, prime Mini the president of Iceland, another lady. And then I remembered, of course, that there had been this cod war between Britain and uh, Iceland, in which warships, small warships, had nudged each other north of the Arctic Circle as a kind of wet run for the Falkland Islands. And uh, there had been no connection between Britain and Iceland since. And Mrs. Finnbogger Dottir was coming over to England to try and smooth everything over as though the whole thing was now forgotten. And I suddenly realized, because I was in, uh, in Iceland seeing a play of mine, which they were performing at the National Theatre. Uh, it was an, I, I don't want to boast, but it was an enormous success. <laughs> It, it ran four nights, which for, for Reykjavik is a very long run, as you know. And, uh, and I remember very well, because Mrs. Finnbogger daughter at that time was not yet president. She was still the secretary of the National Theatre. And so I went to her during rehearsals and said, uh, Mrs. Uh, Finnbog, yes? I said, do you think you give me a seat for the first night in the middle of a row? And uh, it's usual for an author on a first night to sit on the aisle where he can get out quickly <laughs> for various reasons, either to go backstage or to get out of the theater according to the mood of the public. She said, what ticket have I give you? I said, you give me H8. Oh, yes, that's in the middle of a row. Um, I can give you K1. I said, that's marvelous. Yes, there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, give me H8 back. I can still sell it. <laughs> so we forgot that brief encounter was much more important than I could have imagined. 
because since Mrs. Finnbogger's daughter had become president in the interim, uh, as the war was declared, she knew nobody in England, uh, except me, or one or two others probably, but I was among the only ones she remembered because of K H Y. <laughs> and so I was on the her list for lunch. And I arrived at lunch with my wife and we sat on a small table facing Mrs. Thatcher, who is not very good at disguising her emotions. <laughs> and who couldn't understand what we were doing there and kept looking at me with a kind of... <laughs> and eventually she couldn't bear the tension any longer and she said, what are you doing here? <laughs> And I explained the whole business of the tickets and so on. And Mrs. Finbog, her daughter, was awfully sweet. She said, yes, K-1. <laughs> 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 and so that when we got to the dessert, Mrs. Thatcher was in a slightly sunnier mood. You could see that she was trying to um, make up for the abrasiveness. <laughs> And she suddenly said, in a fit of generosity, Why don't we see you here more often? <laughs> I said, because the president of Iceland doesn't come here that often. <laughs> and you've been, you've been knighted. Yes. How, how, how does that, uh, how is that procedure? Well, first of all, they send you a little printed card which has two questions on it, which you must strike out the one which doesn't apply, like... <laughs> and it says, number one, I can kneel. <laughs> number two, I can't kneel. <laughs> and they make no provision for people that can kneel but can't get up again. <laughs> so I telephoned them and they said it would be all right. And then it's... it's, uh, it's it's a very, very English procedure, of course, because it's both very solemn and with a kind of strange tongue in the cheek, because when you're actually kneeling in front of the, the queen, she puts the sword on your shoulder and then lifts it extremely high before she puts it on the other shoulder, which suggests that there has been a calamity <laughs> at some time, and she's decided not to run the risk again. <laughs> but when you're actually kneeling, they were, they, there's a military band which is playing in very strict military rhythm. I could hardly recognize it, my mind was on other things, but they were playing, I'm going to get that man right out of my hair. <laughs> South Pacific, which I thought was a strange choice. <clears throat> You've, um, you never played any instruments, but you play them all, you... Well, I found I could do them better without the instrument. And since I've seen small women struggling onto buses with double basses, I thought, is it worth it? It's much better to... <laughs> you once did, did a whole chamber concerto without... <laughs> I always, well, I still do. I do a Bach cantata and all sorts of... Would work. you like to try that? Bach? Is it solemn enough here? Yes, of course it is, yes. It's a, a Bach cantata uh, called... Uh, Lieber Gott sei doch nicht böse. It's recently discovered in Eisenach from the east. It's made now possible. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, performed by the Kammerchor from uh, the, uh, uh, the Museum der uh, Musikwissenschaft pro Musica Antica in Kassel. <laughs> it's, the largest, it's the largest collection of musical fragments in the world. <laughs> Perhaps even in Europe. <laughs> and it starts with the, the, uh, the aria of the contralto, Ach lieber Gott sei doch nicht böse. Then comes the uh, um, recitativo of the evangelist. Uh, die kleine Propheten kamen alle nach Gothenburg. The minor prophets all came to Gothenburg. And it ends with the Gloria, which is unfinished, but is one of the jewels of early German music. <laughs> 
Need tuning? <laughs> That's the reed without the oboe. <laughs> Choose and tuck. <laughs> Dritten Tag sagte der Herr, hier komme ich nicht weiter. Ich gehe, die kleinen Propheten kamen alle nach Gottenburg in Schweden und da kamen sie alle. <lacht> <lacht> cheap you can save a lot of musicians that way yes i mean they're always going on strike because of me <laughs> what do you think of uh, the situation now in in the russia and the whole new well the russians have been open enough uh, to uh, say that to, to uh, declare at last that brezhnev had been clinically dead for six months before he died but they haven't yet been open enough to admit that he's still walking around Moscow now, trying to find his office among all the shambles. <laughs> but otherwise, I think the situation is uh, very, very intriguing, to say the least of it. I'm the president of the Federation for the Support of Perestroika outside Russia. The president inside is Yakovlev, whom I know quite well and is the most uh, estimable of those people, the most solid. He was the ambassador in Ottawa before. But was this, uh, was this something you expected would happen? Or? Yeah, I hoped it would, and uh, I wrote about it even. I was. I guessed right. When I first wrote a book about Russia, uh, I was accused by everybody at the time of being either naive, a fellow traveler, a sympathizer with communism, and that uh, I didn't have to do anything. I was proved right. And now I've become an expert on the Soviet Union. <laughs> I've, been, I've had to address the Royal Society for International Affairs, 
on the subject of Russia today, and even been invited by the Staff College in London to lecture on the traditions of the Red Army. I declined because I don't like any army, and because I, but it's so stupid if you come to think of it. Just because I said something a little bit before the others, because I was attacked, everybody now thinks, well, he must know. <laughs> Tell me, what about the stock exchange in Leningrad? <laughs> <laughs> but you've worked a lot with, uh, with UNICEF for many years. Yes. When did that start? Oh, that started in 68. 69, 68, you know, between the two. What made you? Start? I was invited to, to, to uh, host, as it were, be the master of ceremonies of a big concert in Paris at the Odeon with many different ballet companies and orchestras. I thought, what is this organization that inspires this amount of goodwill? And it started, of course, as all these things do, with the Polish national ballet, the Mazowsze, dancing Polish folk song, mountaineers dance, the men with top hats with feathers and axes. And they started the usual Polish. And then with one thing, uh, the, the man with an ax cut through my microphone cable. <laughs> And I had to scream for the rest of the evening. The Odeon was an enormous theater. They, couldn't have, they didn't have time to repair it. And I just talked very loud. And I ended up with no voice, but much happier. <laughs> and so then, since then, I've been with UNICEF uh, all the time. But it's been very interesting at times. You meet some very, very interesting situations. I think I told you in Kenya, in a children's hospital, with 102 children, permanent, all the beds are always full, only two doctors for 102 children. And one of the doctors is always somewhere in the provinces dealing with uh, outbreaks of something. And uh, one nurse, majestic woman, a black woman, with six children, all from different husbands, I think because they had no television at the time. <laughs> and very, very proud woman. And uh, we brought her some new equipment which was, of course, wrong. It always is. It was designed for the Arctic. And in Africa, everything had to be changed. But it was a sterilizing equipment. And she was fascinated and then said to me suddenly, you know, when we receive, and they have in this hospital no oxygen, no x-rays, and no ambulance. They have an, one of the earliest Volkswagen Beetles to which the dying person has to climb into the back seat to be <laughs> Terrifying. And uh, she said to me, you know, when we receive a new piece of equipment like this, I shut myself in my room for some time to meditate in order to try and force into my mind what conditions were like before we got the piece of equipment so that when eventually we will be overtaken by uh, modernity, by progress, we won't lose our way as you have done. And I said to the doctor, how do you cope with all these, these illnesses? He said, we're saved by the fact that here in Africa we have far fewer illnesses than you do, and therefore it's much easier to diagnose. We don't need x-rays. We know already what it is. I suppose AIDS has struck a new note, but apart from that, it's all, the, the possibilities are terribly small. Which uh, quality in a human uh, do you find the most important? I think tolerance, because it's a, an emotion, it's a quality of strength. Everybody thinks that tolerance is weakness. It isn't. You have to be awfully strong to be tolerant. And you have to be in the middle of things, too not on an extreme. And I think it's a metaphysical problem. The high notes and the dark notes of the piano are much more dramatic than middle C. And gray is not as dramatic a color as black and white. So I always admire people who take the middle course, which is the balanced course, and not some extreme, which is too easy. That means for, for your children, you would like them to be, to be tolerant, and you, you would be tolerant with them in their... Yes, well, I always have been. 
because I think it's an essential part of nature. I don't think, I don't think it's, it's absolutely useless to tell children what to do. It's much better to behave the way that you want them to behave and let them copy you. <laughs> do, they, do they imitate you? <laughs> I don't know. It's too late now. They're all enormous. They're very old, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think there are, I mean, there are many qualities which are wonderful and many qualities which are not. But I str in my new book, I point out that so many people in the history of the world have been persecuted for what they thought, which is really nobody's business. And very few people have been punished for what they did. Well, the whole Inquisition is because why, what are you thinking? You must be burnt because you're thinking the wrong thing. But some other monster kills thousands of people, like Saddam Hussein, if you wish. Nothing happens at all. But they're still worried about what people think. I think they shouldn't. I think that we should be able to think exactly what we like. And very often somebody that is not a believer but helps an old lady across the road is a better Christian than somebody who's hurrying to church and doesn't see the old lady. <laughs> you have uh, you've, uh, won two Oscars and three Emmys at least uh, and got, you've been knighted, you've been, you even uh, in my show. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> But uh, uh, is there I'm anything? A fellow scholar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is there anything that you, that you uh, that you uh, think you, you would still want to achieve? No. I just like to do what I do better than I do it. <laughs> But I don't think I want to achieve anything. I should hate to be in 10 Downing Street or anywhere else. I mean, politicians. There are some very interesting ones and some very noble characters, but they have to make too many compromises. I'd find that awfully difficult. So in a way, I'm escaping responsibility because it's a, that's a very difficult decision to have to make. And there are some of them that I've known, like Sir Stafford Cripps in London or Helmut Schmidt, who seems to want to make every day the perfect one, but by midday, it's already too late to know. <laughs> so we'll put it off till tomorrow. <laughs> So that, those are very human, human characters. And you've been doing so many uh, different things. You mean uh, you've been setting up operas and... Setting them up? Setting, what do you say, setting? That sounds as if I move the scenery. <laughs> <laughs> you probably did that as well. <laughs> But you've been directing operas. Director, yes. yes. Instructor, I think it is in Danish, isn't it? But you also do, a, you also do an opera without, uh, with any uh, other cast than yourself? Well, I mean, a sort of Italian opera. Yes. How about, can we hear a little of that? I'm not going to move this time. I think it's embarrassing. It gives it too much importance. But the kind of uh, opera that, oh, a little Mozart, early Mozart. She's, she's in her room l lamenting. <laughs> sentito un rumore questa parte eh, oh Dio zitto zitto ma il sole cosa vuole eh, non zitto non va a sentire niente se lui è parato eh, io non so niente e che gli fa fino a in Svezia 22 Anche in Liechtenstein solamente uno. <coughs> eh. 
where the fragment ends. <laughs> right. how, many, how many languages do you speak? Uh, false Italian, false German, <laughs> false uh, Norwegian, also false Danish. I, enough to, I, I speak Danish well enough to read the balance and see the... the, the. <laughs> <laughs> and for real, French? French, I have to speak at home. My wife is French. When I'm very tired, I speak French English with a French accent. She understands that. <laughs> That's also the, the accent you use as Hercule Poirot. Yes, more or less. In <laughs> fact, when I call my wife, I say when she's not in, she leaves the... I say I'm in Gothenburg. There are many suspects up here, and I expect to effect an arrest by tonight. <laughs> in which case, I will be home tomorrow. <laughs> she understands. You can, you can also uh, to, uh, impersonate dogs. <laughs> yes, I had a very... I, had, I was visited to a very unpleasant restaurant in Germany where I got no service. It was in the garden. It was summer. I tried every time the waiter passed. Uh, and I sat there, he served everybody else. And so eventually I thought I must do something to attract his attention. I went, Whoa! <laughs> he came, he came immediately and said, I'm sorry, dogs are not allowed. <laughs> I said, but he's, uh, he's really so, he's, <laughs> he's really so harmless, he's perfectly all right. I'm sorry, sir. If we make an exception in one case, we must make an exception in all the cases. I said, oh, come on. 